Well, good morning and welcome to the Navigator's Bible class. I hope you can hear me. If you can't hear me, do two things. Raise your hand and move to the front. <laughs> I cannot, I, I can't, I, I, that, that's, that's, we're Baptists, right? There's no use in changing that. Uh, how many of you had damage during this, uh, during the hurricane? Raise your hand. Oh boy. How many were without power? Uh, sometimes that's worse than damage, isn't it? Yeah. No water is worse. How about spectrum and a phone? We, uh, we, uh, uh, in our house, we had no power outage, praise the Lord. But we did have some damage to our roof, and we we're, Lord willing, getting a new roof on our house. Roof, roof, depending on what part of the country you are from. <laughs> uh, as we are starting a new... Yes, sir. Did I see a hand? Oh, okay. As we are starting a new series this morning, but before we do, let me um, bring to your attention, I won't do it quite this dramatically uh, next week, but I want to bring to your attention to receive our class notes. I send them out every week, and I do not send partial ones out. I send the whole file out so that when I add to it each week, I will send you the entire file. You can delete the old one as, or replace it with the new one, and you'll stay updated with the entire series notes on your computer. To receive audio files, this is jimscc at gmail.com, and he has all the archives going back to 2009, I believe. So if you want audio files or the notes from the that we've sent out, you can contact Jim. It's uh, his uh, one of his many ministries is to maintain this for anyone who wants it. Also, to receive videos of this class, you can go to our church website, which is fbcruskin.org, and you can go under the section that says videos of services, and you can select that, and you will either get the main service in the auditorium, or this class. You can, or either or, you, they're both there. And you can click on it and get the, uh, the class. I don't know that there's any other classes, are there? No. On that? The alternative to that is go to youtube.com and you can, when it goes to search, search Sandy Weatherholt. And you can go back and get some that aren't on the church website. If you want to get some of the old videos, you can contact Jim Ballard at that email address that we gave on the other slide. Uh, won't, we won't be presenting all this information every time, but at the beginning of this series, we are going to do that. Now... We did not know how many we would have this morning due to the hurricane, so I had two plans for this. If we had a full class, which we seem to have now, plan A was to go directly into our new series, which we will do. The other plan B, which we fortunately will not have to resort to, to is to do uh, just another Q&A session. But fortunately, we are all here, and so we'll go right into our new series. I want to thank um, Randy Tucker for his teaching in the class last week. We appreciate that. 
I, Diane and I were in Memphis, Tennessee at a wedding, and I'm not going to get into that. It was interesting to say the least. <laughs> it was one of those where it was the greater part of a million dollars spent on the wedding, none of, none of which were mine beyond the plane ticket to get there. <laughs> But I did have a unique, well, I'm not going to get into that. Okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to begin our study, and can everyone see the board at this point? Because I hopefully will put up some stuff this morning, write some stuff on the board. Next week, we will be having a different video type setup so that uh, it, it will look better on, on, the, uh, on the internet when you, when you play them back. But for right now, we are still in our old mode, and I'm kind of over here uh, to, so we can do both the, the screen and the, the uh, board. Okay, getting into today, our current series that we're beginning today is a survey of the general epistles. Now the general epistles start at Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, and goes basically through the end of the Bible. Now Revelation is part epistle and part prophecy. Obviously, the big, biggest part of the book of Revelation is prophetic, but there are two chapters and other parts of the book that are aimed a uh, similar uh, application as the general epistles. Now, we say the general epistles, that's what they're called, that's opposed to the Pauline epistles, which begin at the book of Romans and go through Philemon. So in your Bible, those are the Pauline epistles. The general epistles begin after the Pauline epistles and go through the end of the Bible. So we are going to do a survey of the general epistles. Why would we do a survey? Uh, two answers. Number one, we can't do a verse by verse because it would take a long time. We're going to survey the general epistles for this reason. It will be a guide for your personal study of the general epistles. Uh, we don't learn stuff here. We learn stuff about the Bible here. But when you really learn God's Word, it's when you have the Bible open you're reading it and studying it, and the Holy Spirit is speaking to you in your own private study. That's where the learning takes place. So this will be a guide for personal study. Now, I have a book. It's called Principles of Rightly Dividing the Word. This book was written and printed for this class for this class if you do not have a copy of it these are available this morning for you at no cost to you but I would encourage you to pick up a copy where are they they're in the back they're in the back okay uh, this book called the principles of rightly dividing the word this is not a study guide, but it is more like a manual. Uh, if you join the Navy, they give you a book called the Blue Jackets Manual. How many of you ever have one of those? Okay, so you know what the Blue Jackets Manual is. I have the 1944 version of the Blue Jackets Manual, and it tells you everything that a sailor needs to know about ships, about uh, equipment, about munitions, about uh, manual of arms, everything. I also have a 
2000 and I forget the year of it, the Blue Jackets manual. And it tells you everything you know about being politically correct. <laughs> Go figure. Okay. So Such as the 1944 version. Yeah. This is not the 1944 <laughs> version. This this is the uh, um, 2019 version of this book. So please pick this up. If you pick it up, you say I will read it, and it has chapters in. We will not be referring to the book, other than you may find information about what we're doing in the book, but we won't be going uh, by that book. Uh, we're going to learn where these general epistles actually fit in the Bible. Now, the Bible was written, does anybody know what the first book of the Bible was that was actually written down? Job. Job. Yeah. Job. And then, uh, that was back probably prior to the time of Abraham, actually. And then the next book, books that were written were the books of Moses. Uh, those were the first five books that you find in your copy of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Deuter Deuteronomy. <laughs> Deut that's right. Okay. Those were the books of the law, uh, you know, given to God, uh, uh, given to Moses from God. Following that, there's some history uh, that uh, Joshua, Judges, uh, and then we get into the books of the kings. Uh, how many books of the kings were there? Four. First and second Kings, six. First and second Samuel. First and second Kings. First and second Chronicles. There are six of them. The books of the Kings. And um, actually, before we get to that, there's one I missed. The books of poetry. Psalms. Proverbs. Ecclesiastes. Uh, Song of Solomon, those those books, that should have come here. Then we have the books of the kings, which is history that goes all the way back to uh, the time of Samuel. Following the books of the kings, we have the prophetic books. P-R-O-P-G-E, the prophets. That goes from... Isaiah through the end of the Old Testament. Following that, we basically have four books called the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This was sort of the end of the Old Testament. Even though we find them in our New Testament, this is basically Old Testament history. And that ends at the end of the Gospels. And then we have Acts, which is history. That's the beginning of New Testament history, or church history, if you refer to it as that. Then we have the Pauline epistles. Paul wrote, I forget how many, what, 12, 11? I, I forget. They go through Romans, through Philemon. And following Paul's epistles, we have the general epistles at the end. The reason why I'm putting up this for you is because God seems to be moving differently in all of these books. Uh, as, as it progresses, God is doing something different. We see Acts as the beginning of the church age, you know, uh, which we are still in right now. Paul writes his epistles basically to us 
members of the church age or living during the church age. Now, what event is going to end the church age? The rapture. The rapture of the church. 1 Thessalonians 4. That's Paul. He writes the end of the church age. 1 Corinthians 15. That's Paul. He documents prophetically the end of the church age. That's the event we're looking for right now is the rapture. And as we prayed last night, Lord, come quickly. It's getting bad. And we don't know how bad it is. In America, it's bad enough, but it's, it's I mean, it's really bad in the world today. Um, don't want to get into that. We had a lot of that in our last series. But Paul's, the ending of Paul's ideas that, of God that he presented to us was the rapture of the church, the end of the church age. And boom, we get into the general epistles. And as we look at the general epistles, we're going to see that they logically follow Paul's epistles, which basically end with the rapture. His, the, the history, the, the events of his time will end with the rapture. So the general epistles follow that, and with that, we're going to look at uh, some of the things that we're going to study, which are beyond him, Paul, Paul's, Paul's epistles. Um, another reason we're going to look at them is that these Epistles contain many of what some today erroneously refer to as problem passages. Let me state there is no such thing as a problem <coughs> passage. There are many passages that we may not be clear about or understand clearly and God hasn't shown us the meaning and significance of them yet, but we don't call them problem passages. They are a problem to those who are not rightly dividing the word of truth. Hence this book, Principles of Rightly Dividing the Word. They are problems to, the, to Bible students, to believers who aren't putting everything together right, but the passages themselves are not problem passages. Do we understand that particular principle? Okay? I come to a lot of places in Scripture where I say, you know, I don't really understand that, the significance of it, where it fits in, but I am going to believe it. I am going to accept it. And I'm not going to call it a problem passage just because I don't get the significance of it. Okay? I, I wanted to stress that. That is important. I want us to look at this one scripture. Again, this is Paul speaking and he kind of talks about this ver these two verses as everything in the Bible. He is stating God's purposes for the entire book that you have sitting in front of you. And he says this, all scripture, and you, we should know this verse. This, this is one we ought to put in memory. Commentari memoriae whatever the Latin is. Commit to mem memorize. Uh, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. God inspired it. He, can, he gave that to us. I'm not going to get into that doctrine. But all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Profitable means we, pro we profit from it. We benefit from it. This is of use to us 
for these reasons, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. Now what doctrine is, is teaching the basic things of God. The doctrine of God. The doctrine of Christ. About Satan. About demons. About fallen angels. About prophetic things. About the work of Christ on the cross. All of these are doctrines. See? Reproof. That means uh, it's, it's to reprove somebody that's doing something wrong. If you're doing something wrong, you need to be reproved. The reproof of wrong actions. Reproof of sin. Okay? And then correction would be things that we may be teaching or believing that are not correct. That are wrong. And the scripture is given to correct wrong ideas that we may have. Example. A wrong idea is evolution. Hello. That, that we evolved somehow and we're not created. Scripture corrects that particular idea. And for instruction in righteousness. Instruction is is the new stuff, the teachings that help us be more Christ-like. Instruction. That's learning new stuff. If, if we pick up God's Word and we read it and we don't learn something new, we need to look at that situation. Because if we take God's Word and get along with it and Pray to God to show us something. You will always learn something from God's Word. Yes? I have a written note in here. <laughs> Just, uh, but Alan Redpath advised believers to wreck a Bible every 10 years. Read the Bible every 10 years? Wreck it. Wreck it. Wreck, wreck it. it. I, wreck I, I'll I, tear your Bible I've up. got about four Bibles. That... <laughs> wreck your Bible. Use it. Yeah, use it. I, I, I heard somebody once say, somebody that has a clean Bible that may be a dirty Christian, somebody that has a dirty Bible is probably a clean Christian. I, I'm not saying that. I'm just quoting that. I'm saying that that, that is a rel relative uh, thing to say. But you understand the principle of it, that a Bible that is used a lot is going to show wear and tear. But anyway, uh, how we get on? That was your fault. <laughs> My fault. I was just trying to straighten you out, Sam. Okay. <laughs> all right. Here we go. Let's go. Okay. All this he he gives. Scripture is given for this. Why do we need this? And here's the answer. Also in verse 17, that the man of God or the believer, whether you're a man or a woman that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Perfect means complete, wanting nothing. Uh, we look at the word perfect and say, well, that means sinless. Well, we're not sinless. But we are complete in Christ. And one day we will be sinless. And I think that that is one reason why I pray, surely, Lord, come quickly. Because I would like to move out of this sinful state that I am into one who does one that does not worry about sin. That that's a past thing. Wouldn't that be wonderful? It will be. But in this context, it means complete, complete. Nothing missing. <clears throat> thoroughly furnished, thoroughly actually is thoroughly. Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You know what thoroughly furnished means? It means you got everything you need. You've got all the equipment. It's like a soldier that goes to war and he's not only got his rifle, he's got his canteen, he's got this, he's got that. And Paul refers to this also in Ephesians 6, verse 11. 
He says, Wherefore, put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. So, thoroughly furnished indicates that you're ready for combat. And you have studied uh, scripture for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, and you now are equipped to be in the world. Not of the world, but in the world. You're equipped so that when a neighbor or person at work talks to you about something, you're ready to give them an answer. Why? Because you have studied. Because the Word is dwelling in you and you have an answer for them. All right. Now, I want us to get into this. Some of you have heard this till you're blue in the face. Um, but I want to emphasize it again. This is one of the most important things that you'll get out of the Navigator's Bible class. And that there are three applications of Scripture. There is the historical application, which is like it sounds. It relates what was going on at the time the Scripture was penned. <coughs> or it refers to a past time, such as the books of the Kings. It refers back to Samuel, David, Solomon, all these guys. Those are That's historic. The historic application is it was written to or about a, a group that existed in history. We can learn from that uh, as we learn some of the things that these people were going through. The historic application. The next application is the devotional application. This is similar to the two verses that were up there earlier all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for all these things. You can go to any place in the Bible and profit from it devotionally. For instance, when uh, you can go back to like 1 Samuel over here and read about how David was being chased by Saul and Saul was trying to kill him. And you can uh, derive uh, comfort and stuff because God was protecting him. Uh, you can go to the law, the books of Moses, and see God's thoughts about burglary, <laughs> murder, adultery, all these things here. It gives God's standards about that. Uh, and we can profit from that. We can go to the Gospels and see what Jesus went through. What his disciples went through. How he worked with them. And we can profit by uh, applying some of those things to our own life. You can go to any place in Scripture and learn something that will apply or help you out in your Christian life. Doesn't matter where it is. I know uh, Diane was reading uh, a week or two ago, maybe, and she and she was reading uh, about this guy whose son was this guy whose son, and you know all, all these names, just pages and pages of names. And she says, "What in the world can I get out of that?" I just said, "Keep reading it." <laughs> I'm not here to tell you what to get out of that, uh, but and and as some of those listings in Chronicles and so that that seem to go on and on forever, we can get something out of that. I don't know what it is, but you can see through there how God is working, how God is preserving, how God is uh, getting ready to present the Messiah down the line. Uh, devotionally, we can get something out of any place. You open the Bible, no matter what, stick your finger in it, you can get something out of it. 
Alright, we got these two. The third one is this. The doctrinal application. This is where the rubber meets the road. The doctrinal application. There's one word that describes it adequately, and that, and that word is the word specific. S-P-E-C-I-F-I-C. -E -I -I specific. That is a piece of scripture that while we, we can profit from it, may not be specifically aimed at us. Whereas we can learn things from it, it may be specifically aimed at someone else, either before us, or after us, beyond us. It's a specific uh, thing or uh, action that God says do or describes that is for a specific group of people at a specific time in history. Let me, let me give you an example. This guy, Moses, wrote the books of the law. They were specifically written for what group of people? Israel. Israel, Israel the Jews. That was specifically to them. Does that mean we can't profit by reading it? No. We learn a lot by it. There's a lot of prophecy in there. There's a lot of good stuff in there. But it was written specifically for Israel. And if we take some of those commands and say, you got to keep them today, right now, you and I must keep them today, you will be in error because it was not given to you it was given to them them for a specific reason to a specific people we're going to find out that the things that were written specifically for us are the Pauline epistles. Romans through Philemon were <clears throat> written directly to us. That doesn't mean 100% uh, of everything Paul wrote was actually doctrinally for us because he did write some prophetic things. He did write some things about Israel. Romans 9, 10, and 11 were written about Israel. Because he had such a love in his heart for Israel, God allowed him to write those three chapters about Israel. So we must rightly divide. We must understand to whom the Bible is speaking doctrinally. And as we get into the general epistles, we find that a lot of those passages that some people refer to as problem passages are not actually aimed at us doctrinally. They're aimed at someone else. Now, let's fast forward to the rapture of the church. 1 Thessalonians 4. The Lord takes us out of here. Boom. Wonderful. We're gone. Who remains? Those who will live through this, or have to live through the seven year tribulation period. Do we think that God has nothing that is doctrinally aimed at them? Do we think that Israel, who will be uh, hiding from the Antichrist, who will be first deceived by him and then run from him, do we think that God has written nothing for them? Do we see that? And if you fast forward yourself up, suppose there's someone living during the tribulation period 
who looks back on Paul's epistles and reads 1 Thessalonians 4, would that apply to him? No, because that event will have already taken place. Now, as we get into these general epistles, we are going to find that there is a lot of doctrinal, specific stuff that is aimed at people living during the tribulation period. And we will see how that pans out as we survey the general epistles. Now, having said that, there is a lot of stuff in the general epistles that teaches doctrine for everyone. For instance, when it comes to the salvation of the soul, what gets us right with God? What enables us to be with Him in heaven? There's only one way. Whether you were Abraham, whether you were Job, whether you were David, whether you're living today, whether you are living after the rapture, whether you are living during the millennium, there's only one way to be declared righteous before God. And that Paul gave that, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. No one, any time, can ever work their way to heaven. See? Why? Because all our righteousness are as filthy rags. We, our works, are not fit to give to God. It's only through His grace that we are declared righteous. Abraham, and this says that in the Pauline epistles, and it also says it in James. <clears throat> Abraham believed God, and that was accounted to him for righteousness. When we believe Him, God attributes His righteousness to us. What did Paul say to the Philippian jailer when the jailer said, What must I do to be saved? He said, Join the local church and give your money. No, he didn't say that. Oh, he, didn't, he didn't say, Well, your good works must outweigh your bad. He didn't say that. What was his answer to the Philippian jailer? Believe, believe, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. We're going to see in the general epistles where the doctrine of salvation of the soul is the same all through Scripture. And it's the same in the general epistles. Now we will read in the general epistles where it says you better do this to be saved. But there's two types of salvation, people. There's a salvation of the soul which can never be earned by works. And then there's physical salvation. We're going to see during the tribulation period those who are believers who are called before kings and if they do not uh, deny Christ, but they confess Christ before men, they will lose their life. And Jesus said, whosoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. <clears throat> so we're going to see physical salvation many times in the general epistles refers to the time that their bodies will be resurrected, that they will be physically saved, you see. Uh, so there's a lot going into uh, 
this. What time is it? Does somebody have a... 10 after 10. It's 10 after 10. It's 10 after 10. Okay, let me tell you what I'm going to do next. Oh, by the way, these, the purpose of this is to right, rightly divide the word of truth. Next week we're going to look at to whom they are written. To whom these epistles were written. It's very clear to whom they were written. Paul addressed his to the church at Corinth. To the church at Ephesus. To the church at, at Colossae. These are addressed to people just as specifically as Paul addressed his. We're also going to look at, I got four slides <laughs> on the themes of the general epistles. Things which keep reoccurring, reoccurring all through the general epistles. Four slides that I've got on the themes that we'll be looking at. And then one slide I have that says, what do we do to prepare for this? And the answer to that is to read as much of the general epistles as you can every day at, through our, throughout our study. Okay? Read it. Pray over it. And we're going to look at these general epistles and we're going to learn something from it. Uh, if you don't have this book, pick it up and read it. It is a tremendous aid in your Bible study. Okay? So much for introduction part one. <coughs> I thought I was going to get through it today. I didn't. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. Lord, we realize that it is a miraculous book. The more we read it, the more we realize that no man could have written it, that no bunch of men could have written it, but only you could have been the author as you gave it to all of these men over 1,500 years period of time. Lord, help us to read it, to love it, to memorize it, to teach it, and give it out. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.